nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So uh, I'm uh, John Dowling. I, I'm sitting here comfortably at Louisiana State University. And since this is a quantum chemistry program, I decided to do a chemistry experiment and look up the temperature in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, compared compare it with Purdue. So currently it's 77 Fahrenheit in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but it feels like 80 uh, because of the heat index. And uh, it's currently 40 degrees in Purdue, but it feels like 35 because of the wind chill. <laughs> so the homework assignment is for what temperature and what percent humidity does the temperature you actually have feel like the temperature it actually is, it's not going up or down? That's not really a homework assignment. <laughs> Anyway, so I, I, I'm at Louisiana State University. I'm a physicist, not a chemist. Okay. Uh, but some of my best friends are oh, chemists. I'm sorry, no, I just uh, okay. I worked at uh, uh, the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory for a number of years in the quantum computing group. Uh, I also worked at the U.S. Army Aviation and Missile Command in the quantum optics group. And you can see that I have some degrees and other things up there that the uh, uh, allows you to think that I might have some idea of what I'm talking about. And this picture, for some of the some of the people in the audience, this was taken by uh, 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 Aronoff at a conference that Aronoff ran on quantum technologies a couple of years ago. In Aronoff is a big shot in quantum weird quantum effect. The same Aronoff as Bohm Aronoff effect. So, um, all right. Okay, so that's the introductory slide, and uh, that's my group, Quantum Science and Technologies Group, and I'm a co-director for the Institute for Theoretical Physics, and the, the funny yellow background that in, in on the slide is a picture of a quantum computer made by D-Wave Corporation. Next slide, please. And so my background was actually in something called the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics, so this is a as sort of a philosophical study of the, of the quantum nature of reality that goes back to debates between Bohr and Einstein back in uh, the 1920s. And when I first uh, told some of the professors at the University of Colorado where I got my PhD, I was working the foundations of quantum mechanics, they told me it was crackpot stuff and I would never get a job. However, uh, uh, I, I didn't actually listen to them, and it turned out that out of the foundations of quantum mechanics, this philosophical uh, discussion, came a lot of interesting new technologies in about 1994 in particular. People became aware of uh, new technologies emerging from the philosophical uh, uh, discussions of the underlying uh, understanding of quantum mechanics. And I, so now it's the PowerPoint, so there's, there's going to be animation. So if you can click, something should come up. So quantum technology sort of embraces this foundations of quantum mechanics. Next slide, please. And then I'm going to talk about quantum computing, quantum cryptography, and quantum sensors, and quantum imaging. And I can assure you, for all of those four things, you can actually get a job. And I actually have one now. And uh, uh, so we'll start with uh, the overarching theme. I think we'll start with quantum computing first. Then we'll dive back into the foundations of quantum mechanics and then talk about quantum cryptography, quantum sensors, and quantum imaging. And these are all things that I have worked on or helped advise the U.S. government on. So the first one will be quantum computing. Next slide, please. Okay. Ah, but at first, when I give this talk, people go, people are familiar with nanotechnology, which is the discussion of things that are very small about the size of a nanometer. And people go, well, how is quantum technology different? Is it smaller than nanotechnology? Next slide, please. So nanotechnology was got kicked off uh, by an after-dinner speech in Caltech by Richard Feynman in 1960. You can see him on the left. And he, uh, I've updated this a little bit, but uh, he basically argued that all the information in every computer in the world could be stored uh, one bit, one atom at a time in a chunk of silicon. Uh, about the size of a centimeter across. There, there are 10 to the 21 silicon atoms. If we think of each silicon atom as a single bit, and I can put all the information in the, in the world, 10 to the 21 bits on a, a single bit of silicon that day, which sounds very impressive. And the atoms are nanometer in size, and that's, that, that's nanotechnology. Quantum technology, uh, this, this after dinner speech was called, uh, there's plenty of room at the bottom. So my spin off of this is that there's plenty more room in the quantum. That's 
a picture of me in my lab at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory wearing my laser goggles. And the point is that using quantum technology, I can store all the information in every computer in the world in only 70, 70 silicon atoms by switching from bits to quantum bits. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. But I get an exponential storage improvement by switching over to quantum nature of reality rather than an ordinary classical physics, which was Feynman's point in 1960. Next slide, please. So frequently asked question, next slide, please. And I apologize, I didn't realize this was going to be the version with all the little animations. Is quantum technology smaller than nanotechnology? And the answer is, next slide, no, it's much weirder than nanotechnology. And as Hunter S. Thompson, the Gonzo journalist, used to say, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. And this is probably why I embrace this field. Next slide, please. Okay. So uh, what was supposed to be on the left there is a picture of all of the uh, uh, things that human beings have studied over the past 2,000 years in terms of three-dimensional space. And uh, in the past uh, 2,000 years, we've studied everything from uh, things the size of uh, super strings uh, on the very small side, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, up to the size of the galaxy. Uh, and then up to the size of the known universe, which is 14 billion light years. And that chart should have shown it, it, uh, all of those things span about uh, 60 orders of magnitude uh, in meters, okay, and three-dimensional space. Now, on the right, uh, there was supposed to be another picture there, but the result is at the bottom. Uh, if you ask Bill Phillips, one of the things we're going to talk about is a quantum computer that uses quantum bits. And you, uh, you, you ask the question, well, what good is the quantum computer? And one of the things you might want to do with this is the cracking secret codes on the Internet. To do that, you need about a million quantum bits. So what, what that arrow is supposed to show is uh, two to the million on the right-hand side uh, is, can be rewritten and based in at, at 10 to the 300,000. Now, if you ask Bill Phillips at NIPS, he has a Nobel Prize, and so that hopefully means he's smart. When are we going to have a million qubit quantum computers? He says, well, there's a 50-50 chance, and by that I mean we'll have, there's a 50% chance we'll have one in 50 years. So if that's correct, we'll have a 1 million qubit machine, you know, 1 million entangled quantum particle machine in 50 years. So in 50 years, we're going to span 300,000 orders of magnitude in this new uh, quantum uh, computational space called Hilbert space. And compare that to the paltry 60 orders of magnitude in three-dimensional space, which took all of humanity 2,000 years to cover. So uh, this is the acceleration of history in real time. So, so there's 60 orders of magnitude in three-dimensional space. And I don't know what Hilbert space actually looks like uh, when you go out to 300 uh, orders of magnitude in dimensions in Hilbert space. So I took this ancient map of, uh, 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 of the, the Atlantic Ocean, and you can see there are sea monsters, and that there's the Nina, the Pisa, and the Santa Maria sailing in the wrong direction. And uh, so Hilbert space contains a vast unknown uh, 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 dimensional space that we're just beginning to explore. Right now, we're now in the, in the regime where we have 10 to 14 in, uh, qubits uh, entangled quantum particles. But if we get to a million qubits in 50 years, we're going to expand 300,000 orders of magnitude in this unexplored quantum dimensional space. Uh, and, and the m number is just mind-boggling to me, which is why I like this picture. Number six, please. So uh, quantum and nanotechnology are related uh, for many of the things in quantum mechanics. Uh, for the quantum weirdness to be manifest, often <coughs> solid state systems and chemical systems, uh, it, things become more quantum mechanical if they're small. So there you see Einstein playing with Schrodinger's cat, which is playing with dice on a chessboard up in the left-hand corner. Uh, you don't normally see quantum mechanical effects in cats, but you do see quantum mechanical effects in electrons and atoms. So smaller is better. And the search uh, to uh, develop new quantum technologies that allow, is driving a lot of new advances in nanotechnology, trying to make uh, mass-fabricated uh, nano-sized devices where the quantum effects are manifest. And, and uh, it, uh, 
And the converse is, uh, as we develop new nanotechnologies and get smaller, we can uh, get down to the quasi-atomic regime where quantum mechanics begins raising in its head. In fact, people predict within the next 10 years or so, the Moore's law for uh, computing will come to an end uh, simply because the transistors on your Intel chip will be one atom in size and the quantum mechanical effects will essentially uh, destroy the uh, functioning of an Intel chip for doing uh, playing uh, World of Warcraft or some other video game your students might be playing. But the idea is to embrace these quantum mechanical effects when you hit atomic size transistors on a chip and use them in this new paradigm of quantum computing as opposed to classical computing. Next slide, please. So quantum scientists, this is the second revolution. The first revolution, we developed a whole theory of quantum mechanics from about the 1900s to the 1990s, there's some overlap, and we use these new quantum me mechanics to explain the world around us. So this is what I call a science. When you develop a new theory to explain what you see is what nature gives to you, with, you know, uh, the periodic table, I list a whole bunch of things here. Uh, if the periodic table was not understood until quantum mechanics came along, and the ordering of the atoms in the periodic table is a good example of the science. Using quantum mechanics, we can order the electrons in orbitals, and understand why the uh, uh, the elements in the periodic table repeat in the way that they do, and we explain. But we don't actually build the atoms in the periodic table; we just explain their properties. That's what I'm calling a science. Next slide, please. The, uh, the, so the first revolution allowed us to understand the quantum world, and in, in quantum information theory, which is where a lot of these technologies lie, there's there's always two characters that come from classical information theory: Alice and Bob. But in the quantum world, uh, Alice and Bob are entangled and are in some sort of weird relationship. But in an uncertain, a Heisenberg uncertain quantum world, they can't be sure what the relationship actually is. Next slide, please. So this quantum technology, to uh, contrast with science, is now we're taking some of these weird properties of quantum uh, mechanical uh, uh, atoms and, 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 and chips and transistors and superconductors and putting them work and building things that don't exist in nature and don't exist anywhere in the universe unless they are on alien planets who also have developed quantum technology. So we've gone from explaining the universe around us to building new things. Uh, quantum cryptographic systems, quantum, quantum co code breaking algorithms, uh, uh, quantum transistors being developed in atoms and photons for quantum computing. Uh, quantum cryptography has now been demonstrated over 100 kilometers. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end. There's a program in quantum imaging now, using, you know, going below the Rayleigh diffraction limit with quantum entangled photons, and using quantum sensors to make and do metrology or sensing uh, below the classical shot noise limit, the limits imposed by ordinary classical mechanics. Next slide, please. So the second quantum, uh, the second revolution will allow us to manipulate the quantum world around us, and this this is caught on. Even this is a 1997 cartoon from Dilbert, and it, already they're talking about quantum computers capable of interacting with matter from other universes to solve complex equations. Bogbert disagrees or objects. According to chaos theory, your ch tiny change to another universe will shift its destiny, possibly killing every inhabitant. Uh, Dilbert replies, ship happens, and then fire, that's supposed to be a quantum computer, the little box with the antenna sticking out of it. Next slide, please. I can't hear people laughing, but I hope I'm Some groaning going on in the background. Okay. So how do quantum computing, we're going to go back into the foundations of quantum mechanics and talk a little bit about Schrodinger's cat, because everybody likes that, and then we'll talk about cryptography sensors and imaging. Next slide, 12, please. So uh, quantum computing, uh, it's easy to understand in classical computing that if you have lots of parallel processors, uh, you get it speed up in computational power. So a good example is some of the big Cray computers at Los Alamos have trillions, trillion is probably too small, trillions and trillions of parallel processors. But all those parallel processors exist in a warehouse size facility, and the Something like 10% of the entire New Mexico electricity grid goes to Los Alamos, and another 10% goes to cooling those computers in that building 
we do calculations for hydrogen and atomic bomb explosions in there, so we don't have to do a simulation. We can do simulations and not actually do tests of these weapons anymore, which is a great thing. But computational parallel processors are very expensive in time, money, and power, electrical power. My thing about the quantum computer is that it's an exponential of parallel processors, but they're in parallel universes where I don't have to pay the electric bill. Next slide, please. And what does that mean? Okay, so here's an example. This is an old-fashioned odometer from, I know they're digital now, but in the old days, the odometer on your car was a little wheel, and you would buy the car brand new, and the, all, let's say there were six wheels, okay? They would all, it'd start off at zero, 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 zero. Then when you go your first mile, the first wheel goes and turns over to one. You go your second one, and finally gets up to nine miles, then the second wheel clicks 10, and then you get your, your, your tens, your, your hundreds, thousands, and so forth, until you finally hit a million, and then it rolls over again. So this odometer is capable of displaying one six-digit number at a time, and that's, that's the classical analog of a uh, six base and uh, computer register. Next slide, please. In a quantum computer, we have this ability to entangle the bits in the register, the wheels of the odometer in this example, so that we can actually not only display but process all 99,999 numbers simultaneously. So the classical odometer somehow is, is processing one number at a time, even though there are a large number of potential numbers that can be displayed. The quantum odometer can somehow display and then process all of those numbers simultaneously at once. And that's, where, that's the spooky element of the, the quantum uh, 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 exponential growth in this, this quantum mechanical space. And those, but I'm only paying for the, ten we, the six wheels on the odometer, but I have uh, uh, almost a million uh, uh, processors, even though most of those processors are in parallel universes where I don't have to pay the bill. That's the idea. Next slide, please. So what, is, what would be the application of this? People were talking about quantum computing from the mid-1980s. Richard Feynman uh, most notoriously suggested that whenever you try to simulate up the quantum chemistry problems, like simulating the ground state of the element thulium on a classical computer, due to the quantum nature of the correlations between the electrons and the thulium atom, classical computers suffered an exponential slowdown trying to simulate the chemical properties of thulium. So Feynman brilliantly turned this around and said, well, what is thulium could, should be considered as a, a, a computer, a quantum computer that's using quantum properties that can perfectly simulate itself. If I take a thulium nucleus and drop uh, uh, 69 electrons into it, within a few nanoseconds, it settles down into its ground state. If I try to actually simulate that process on a Cray supercomputer, it takes me longer than the lifetime of the universe. Uh, it has to do with this exponential growth of the computational space associated with the quantum uh, uh, spins of the electrons. So Feynman turned this around and said, well, maybe I can make a new kind of computer, a quantum computer, that exploits this exponential slowdown on classical problems. And if I, I have a quantum computer, maybe I get an exponential speed up on some classical math problems of interest. That was about 1984. And in 1994, Peter Shore at Bell Labs showed that there was a very practical problem of interest to particularly people like the CIA and the National Security Agency that could be hacked with a quantum computer. So I have a picture here. This is every, every time you do a banking transaction on the internet, you get a little lock, a padlock that shows up in your browser. Uh, and what it's doing is it's encrypting the information that goes back and forth between you and the bank. So people who are uh, maybe tapping into the internet at various points can read your banking information, your social security number, other uh, information. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a public key encryption system, and it's based on something you probably learned in third grade, or at least I did. Multiplication is much easier than long division, at least sister uh, uh, Mary Frances beat that into me literally with a ruler in third grade. So uh, multiplying two numbers is easy. If I give you the two numbers on the left, multiplying it out by hand isn't that hard, and you get the number on the right, okay? Multiplication of two large numbers is the encryption process. Uh, 
is the basis of the inscription. Next slide, please. But the vision is hard. If someone hands you the encrypted secret message, your banking information, in order to decrypt it, that involves doing the reverse, starting with the large number on the left, 502560, and dividing it out into the two prime numbers that it's composed of. The fastest algorithm for doing that is essentially uh, what everybody learns in college algebra, I would first take that long number on the left and divide it by two and see if it went evenly, and then divide by three and see if it went evenly, see if, and then divide five and see if it went evenly. If I did this one per second, it would take me longer than the lifetime of the universe. And that's why these public keys on the Internet are secure, because factoring a large number into its component prime numbers is very hard on a classical machine. So public key encryption, 128-bit keys, for example, are typically uncrackable, on a, uh, take longer than the lifetime of the universe. 512, 1024-bit keys are even better. Next slide, please. That's the ENIAC computer in the background there. So dividing big numbers are very hard. Uh, best internet encryption, these are the ones that are typically used by people like the National Security Agency, are, are, are a thousand digit numbers. And those are for sure uncrackable. Even if you took all the computers on Earth and wired them together, it would take you longer than the lifetime of the universe to factor a thousand digit number and break the secret code. So factoring is closely related to code breaking using this particular encryption system. So the bad guys are safe if you exploit only classical computers. Next slide, please. The bad guys are Natasha Nogudnik and Boris Badenov from Rocky and Bullwinkle. Anybody recognize that? I, 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 can, I can actually see everybody in the corner. Somebody raised the guy in blue shirt raised his hand. Okay. So in 1992, there was a curious movie that came out, Sneakers. Who saw the movie Sneakers? Now that I have an audience, I can see. Okay, great. So the, the plot, very improbable for Hollywood, was based on a mathematician who discovered a classical fact factoring algorithm and for reasons known only to him programmed it into a telephone answering machine and the whole movie involved finding that answering machine and shooting the good guys and the bad guys and the, and the NSA got involved and so forth. So that was 1992 and there is no known classical factoring algorithm that that, uh, that is uh, uh, fast, uh, which is the plot of the movie Sneakers. You can see what had Cindy Portier, Robert Redford, it says, we could tell you what it's about but then we'll have to kill you. On the right, in 1994, Peter Shore derived an algorithm that, if run on a quantum computer, could factor large numbers fast. And by fast, we mean exponentially fast. So if a classical computer would take longer than the lifetime of the universe to factor a 2,000-digit number, the quantum computer would do it in less than a second. That would, be, that would basically allow you to hack the entire Internet, read all of the banking transactions. And this is when uh, the National Security Agency and people like this became very afraid. Okay, next slide, please. So, uh, after some initial confusion between Peter Shore at Bell Labs and Gene Shallow, the movie critic, next slide, please. I got to chuckle something. Uh, people began working on quantum computing and developing the hardware that it would allow you to do this. There was a something, uh, there was a D wave quantum computer made by a company in Canada based on a superconducting technology. It's not very good for a factory, but that's the thing that's green and yellow up in the upper left. Uh, but it is good for doing a, a type of a speeded up search algorithm. And in fact, uh, they just sold their first $10 million superconducting quantum search engine to Google the, earlier this year. So you figure Google isn't, well, maybe Google is throwing millions of dollars at stuff that's useless. But we hope not. In any case, uh, people are looking at this type of quantum uh, search engine uh, for, for doing uh, improved searches on the Internet. Uh, over on the right is an ion trap quantum computer. The individual ions in the trap are the quantum bits. Some of the things that I've worked on are lower left are photonic quantum computers for the photons, the spins, the polarization of individual photons with the quantum bits. And people are looking at either the nuclear spins or the electron spins uh, in semiconductors, also with quantum bits, to build the hardware that would allow you to do things like factor large numbers quickly. So, and before 1990, I was really interested in quantum technologies, but then this killer app came along that said you could basically do all this code breaking in 1994. So, back to never getting a job. I used to go to conferences on the foundations of quantum mechanics where we talked philosophy. Before 1994, they were held at the Motel 6 
uh, just outside the Newark airport, uh, because that's all the funding we could get for the conference. After 1994, we had funding from the National Security Agency, and the first one I attended after 1994 was on the Isle of Capri off the coast of Naples in a beach resort. So something happened in 1994 that got everybody's attention at that level of detail. Next slide, please. I'm hearing chuckles now, good, okay. So you can't buy it in, in, in spite of this storefront here. You can't buy a quantum computer just yet. Uh, well, I, I should say a, a general purpose one. You can buy this quantum search engine and machine. Uh, but people are looking to develop these. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, I thought I would do something fun here. I often go to this conference that, that for the Department of Defense called the Mad Scientist Conference, where they have uh, uh, I have a badge I proudly wear that says Jonathan Dowling, Mad Scientist on it. And they have science fiction writers and futurists, and, and Ray Kurzweil is there. We talk about future technologies that might bring, bring down the end of civilization like all good mad scientists do. And many of these people talk about the class, what they call classical, classical artificial intelligence. And this is the Terminator hypothesis, uh, scenario that the computers take over the Earth and kill off all the human beings. And one of the things they don't talk about is, well, I go, well, okay, the classical computers take over the Earth. They only got about three or four years before the quantum uh, computers take over the Earth, take it away from the classical computers, and uh, there will be like a two-step process where the computers are battling it out. So on the bottom, you can see uh, on that scale, your laptop would be the classical intelligence, uh, which is the Geico caveman. Uh, your quantum computer is the Brainiac Martian on the right, and, and unfortunately, human beings are the amoeba in the middle by 2025 AD. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, back quick in the foundations of quantum mechanics, and then I'll do a, a splash and burn through quantum sensors and quantum imaging. Next slide, please. So, origin of quantum weirdness. There are collections of quantum mechanical particles spins of electrons and nuclei and photons exhibit bizarre non-local action at a distance, unreal correlations not found in any classical system. This was in fact why Einstein uh, vociferously objected to quantum mechanics because of these unreal non-local action at a distance uh, statistical correlations. These correlations have a name, it's called quantum entanglement, it was given to him by Erwin Schrodinger of Schrodinger's cat and from that paper. Quantum mechanics is a feature of the weirdness of quantum mechanics, not necessarily the size. For electrons and, and nuclei, certainly size is important. You only see these effects in, in single atoms or, or, or uh, small semiconductors or superconductors. But there have been experiments demonstrating quantum entanglement over hundreds of kilometers, 100 kilometers in fibers, and over distance of meters in, in gas clouds. So it's not necessarily small, it just has to be necessarily weird. Strange non-local correlations not found in any classical system. Next slide, please. So that brings us to Schrodinger's cat. I'm dead, I'm alive, I'm dead, I'm alive, now I'm dead and alive. I just went out of the goddamn box. Next slide, please. If you type Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat into Google image search, you get lots of interesting things. So Schrodinger had a, a paper that came out in 1930 that pointed out several problems with quantum mechanics that he didn't like, and this was the origin of the famous cat paradox. And he, the, in the experiment, which is shorthanded here, you had an atom that was in the box with the cat. If the atom decays, which is shown on the right, you can, it, it, it triggers a flask of cyanide to kill the cat. And you can see the upside down cat, if you look carefully, it's an X for an eyeball. That shows it's dead. Okay. Then on the left, the atom hasn't decayed, the cyanide hasn't been released, and the cat is alive. So Schrodinger talked about lots of issues with this cat in the box. Uh, first of all, the cat is simultaneously a dead and alive, and so you look at it, and, and observers are required to collapse the cat to dead and alive. But I'm focusing on one point, and he actually uses this term entangled, that the state of the cat and the state of the atom are entangled. So you could actually open the box, and you put the atom on one side of the box with a partition, and look at the atom. If the atom, your act of measuring the state of the atom causes the atom to collapse, to either decay or not decay, that instantaneously kills the cat or does not kill the cat on the other side of the box. So now you carefully separate these two halves of the box, put the cat on Alpha Centauri, put the atom on Beta Victoris, that's 26 light years apart, 
an observer, Bob on Data Victorious, opens the box, looks at the atom, the atom collapses to decay, and the cat instantaneously dies on Alpha Centauri 26 light years away. This is what Einstein did not like about quantum mechanics. Next slide, please. Because things shouldn't happen instantaneously over 26 light years. Einstein spent a lot of time showing that things don't happen faster than the speed of light. So Einstein also, in 1930, the same year as the Schrodinger cat paper, actually Schrodinger's cat came out after this paper, attacked quantum mechanics. And in fact, this is actually the title of the review of the paper from the New York Times, Einstein attacks quantum mechanics. Boris Podolsky leaked a copy of the paper to the New York Times a few weeks earlier prior to publication. Einstein never spoke to him again, and he was railroaded out of the uh, Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton uh, 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 with a coven of theoretical physicists chasing him with pitchforks and torches. Well, okay, I exaggerate slightly. But in any case, Podolsky got in trouble over this. But the point was, Einstein also pointed out this strange entanglement business that, that you have in quantum mechanics systems that are located far apart that seem to be highly correlated and the measurement on one system changes the state of the other system and Einstein suggested that quantum mechanics should not have such features and reality should not have such features and we should replace quantum mechanics with a, a different theory that would not have this, these non-local correlations. Next slide please. So here's the deal. Einstein says, can this, I'm now replacing the cat and the atom with spinning electrons versus spinning tops. So the spinning electrons have these weird spooky action at a distance correlations, and A is alpha centauri and B is beta pictoris. And Einstein said, well, maybe we could replace it with something like statistical mechanics or thermodynamics where we have sort of a nice statistical theory that explains when I measure one particle being spinning up, the other particle is spinning down and there's no collapse and instantaneous action at a distance, and all of this goes away. And then quantum mechanics becomes a branch of statistical mechanics, and Einstein would have been very happy with this. And this sort of statistical and mechanics interpretation of quantum mechanics would be called a hidden variable theory. I won't go to the origin of that term. Next slide, please. So this was philosophical uh, 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 ruminations that went on from 1930 to 1960, and then John Bell, who worked at CERN, wrote a paper that actually said, well, uh, he investigated the Einstein hidden variable theory, the classical theory, in these very general terms, and compared it to the theory of quantum mechanics and showed, well, Einstein's program is wrong, that it cannot, you cannot construct a, a theory that is local with no action at a distance that reproduces all the predictions of quantum theory. Even better, Quantum theory and the Einstein hidden variable theory give different predictions in the lab. So after 30 years of philosophical debate, it now becomes a physics problem. Well, we no longer debate the philosophy. We go into the lab and measure things and see which one is right, quantum theory or Einstein's theory. Next slide, please. This occurred in uh, early 1970s, uh, early 1980s and late 1970s. John Klaus and Alan has faced it. Uh, you can't do experiments with cats because the uh, people for ethical treatment of animals go after you. So you have to work with photons, which don't have their own support group. But they had, instead of cats with atoms entangled, they had horizontal and vertical photons from the cesium cascade. And they measured these non-local correlations uh, and compared them to the Einstein-inspired classical theory and the full theory of quantum mechanics and ruled out the classical theory of Einstein and rules quantum mechanics in. And these experiments have gotten better and better and better ever since 1980. So next slide, please. So Einstein complained about quantum mechanics. God does not play dice was one of his famous quotes. And, and it just turns out Einstein was right about a lot of things, but wrong about this. Quantum mechanics has strange non-local correlations with things that are a lot like instantaneous action at a distance. And we, my position on this is let's stop agonizing over this. The experiments show what's actually here. Uh, it, this is reality, but it's a work. Next slide, please. So uh, the next application is a little bit more near term is quantum cryptography. Next slide, please. This is the answer to the quantum computer. Uh, quantum cryptography uses a, a, a different type of encryption protocol called the one-time pad private secret, uh, uh, secret key system. This is different than factoring and, and multiplying numbers, 
Uh, you have a pad. In the old days, there was an actual pad of paper that looked like that picture there on the left that would be transported to U.S. embassies and diplomatic pouches. Each symbol in the message that you would try to encrypt, you would uh, match it to a symbol one at a time. You can see the numbers in red, one, two, three, four, down the list. And you would replace your symbol in your message uh, uh, with one of the random symbols from the pad. As long as the symbols on the pad were purely random, you didn't reuse the pad. This was an unbreakable secret code. And Claude was proposed in, uh, with, in the terms of Morse code and telegraph in the Civil War, proven unbreakable mathematically by Claude Shannon in the 1940s. And it's even unbreakable on a quantum computer. So the idea of the quantum people is to replace the public key encryption with factoring and, and, and multiplication with this type of secret key system. But what's the problem? Next slide. The problem is, is that in classical mechanics, you could always make a copy of the pad. So in the old days, they would take this pad in a diplomatic pouch and handcuff it to somebody's arm and, and fly it into the embassy in Moscow. But the, the guy carrying the pad could always be drugged, or he could always be shot, or he, any number of things. And you're never sure, or bribed, you're never sure that somebody didn't get into that pouch, remove the pad, and make a copy. That would be the eavesdropper in the middle eave. Alice is the sender. That's Alice Cooper for complete gender bending. So if anybody recognizes Bob on the right, you have to be from the UK to recognize Bob. Bob is, Bob is female. She's a character from a, a British sitcom called Black Adder. Why her name is Bob, nobody knows. But the, the English always get this joke. In any case, the problem with this classical system is that the eavesdropper can always copy the pad. That's why it's not used except in the most hush-hush secret uh, diplomatic uh, situations because this pad has to be transported. Because there's only a way to transport the pad in a way that we can be sure nobody could copy it, we'd be home free. Next slide. The ghost of Heisenberg now comes to the rescue. Instead of transmitting a pad with a sheet of paper, which we could put into a copy machine, we now encode in these random uh, 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 symbols as zeros and ones in binary on the pad in quantum mechanical states of uh, the polarization of single photons. And without going into too much detail, the idea is, is that if uh, there is something in quantum mechanics called the no coding theorem, you're not allowed to make a copy of an unknown quantum mechanical state, in particular the polarization of the photon. Uh, this is related to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If you try to measure the state of a photon, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells you will uh, irreversibly uh, disrupt the state of the photon. And, and scramble any information that's contained in it. So the idea of quantum cryptography is you transmit information using single photons. Uh, the key, the classical encryption is done later over the internet or cell phone, but once Alice and Bob share the key, uh, they can use this to encrypt. Eve, if she tries to make a copy, will scramble the quantum mechanical states. Alice and Bob can do some checks and see if it's been scrambled and know if the pad has been copied or not. And this system then is unbreakable, ultimately secure, and the pad is guarded by the ghost of Heisenberg. Next slide, please. So just to show you this is not all la-la land, you can buy quantum crypto systems for about $10,000. There's a company in the U.S. called MagicQ. BBN had a prototype system that the, the red and the yellow spool thing on, on the right and the thing down at the bottom, I believe, is the uh, system from uh, ID Quantique sold by Switzerland. So you can actually buy quantum crypto systems. Uh, next slide, please. And people have actually used them to do things. So there, uh, people are also talking about uh, there are two programs to actually send entangled uh, photons and, and, and single photons to satellites. The Americans are interested in rekeying the spy satellites on the fly. The Europeans are interested in doing more fundamental uh, basic physics research. On the left in the lower corner, you see a prototype quantum local area network that ran between a bunch of computers around Cambridge uh, and Harvard and, uh, and universities in, uh, in Boston. On the right, I can't show you the, the uh, uh, Defense Department quantum uh, key uh, cryptography system uh, because I'm not allowed to. I hope I'd have to kill you, but it runs around the beltway from one government lab to another government lab. Next slide, please. And people
people have already demonstrated in 2008, transmitting single photons to satellites and back. So the idea of rekeying satellites on the fly using the system is near term. Next slide, please. And in the past few years, the Swiss used quantum cryptography to transmit votes from the federal Swiss election under Lake Geneva. That sounds pretty practical. And the Austrians actually used it to transfer banking information under the Danube River using a quantum crypto system. So quantum cryptography is a little bit more near term. It's here and now, and people are actually using these systems for practical things. All right, and I know I'm running probably way over. Somebody, somebody close to starting. Yeah. Yeah. Get close. I'm okay. So I'll whiz through, I will begin accelerating, okay, quantum sensors is next. <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 uh, the idea is that we have these wacky correlations for, that I, I've argued that are based on this Schrodinger cat business, the things that Einstein didn't like. And the first application in 1994-ish was to quantum computing and quantum cryptography and quantum crypto analysis. One of the things that I've been working on is using this wacky, weird uh, correlations of quantum systems for other uh, for applications such as sensors, uh, improved global positioning system. Um, one idea uh, is to use quantum entanglement to uh, improve the sensitivity of your GPS receiver, knock out some of the fluctuations and noise that you get from the transmission of the signals from the satellite to the ground receivers through the turbulent atmosphere. And so the idea is that you might be able to take these ideas from quantum computing and cryptography and foundations of quantum mechanics and build other things. This is called gadgets from the quantum spook cap. Next slide, please. So quantum sensors, the idea here is that classical sensors have an ultimate sensitivity, signal to noise called the shot noise limit. Quantum sensors exploiting quantum entanglement, this weird non-local quantum correlations, can beat by orders of magnitude, the shot noise limit that's typically limiting classical sensors, there's a new limit called the Heisenberg limit appropriately. And the Heisenberg limit can be many orders of magnitude more sensitive than classical shot noise limit. Next slide, please. So the idea is if you look at it, uh, an, uh, an interference diagram as this is the type of sensors we usually uh, think about, the red signal is supposed to be an interferogram from an optical interferometer, but it could be a, 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 an atomic clock interferometer. Most of our sensors are interferometric uh, type devices. The idea is the classical signal is in red, and your, what the sensitivity is your ability to tell if that red line, uh, red curve shifts uh, uh, horizontally on you. And that's related to the slope of the curve. If the slope is very shallow, uh, it's hard to tell if the red line has moved or not. So ideally, you would like to move to something like the blue curve, where the slope of the sides of the curve is steeper. So if the curve shifts slightly, it's easier to tell. That's the bottom line of what the quantum buys you. And we can uh, bundle, for example, in this case, five uh, photons in, together at a time in an entangled state and actually generate that uh, five-fold uh, wiggling curve and use it to uh, 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 boost the sensitivity of gravity in measuring devices, if we're using atoms, magnetism, if we're using photons, arranging, and uh, if we're using also photons, and, and best building better atomic clocks using atoms, uh, particularly ions held in a trap. Next slide, please. And so we've been working on using techniques like this to build better uh, magnetic field sensors, magnet magnetometers. Next slide, please. Back of the envelope calculation shows that such a thing as on a spaceship could detect camouflage tanks from orbit based on their ferromagnetic signature alone. Next slide, please. And the atomic gravity radiometer, this was something that was of interest to NASA. They have a, a gravity mission that measures the gravitational field of the Earth and then inverts that to measure, for example, ice melting in the Antarctic uh, uh, due to climate change. Uh, it has limited sensitivity. We proposed switching uh, to an atomic system that would have uh, uh, better resolution uh, using quantum entanglement. Next slide, please. And uh, you could actually even make something sensitive enough to look for man-made underground 
the structures from orbit using such a device based on the gravitational signature of the underground hole or tunnel. This is of interest to the Department of Defense. Next slide, please. So we're getting near the end. So navigation, gyroscopes, people are interested in the Navy in particular in not using the GPS for navigation because GPS satellites can be jammed or they can be blown up. The Chinese actually just recently blew up a old communication satellite just to show that they could do it. It made everybody nervous. And the Navy is really interested in this because if you're submerged, you don't have access to the GPS satellites. The signal doesn't penetrate the water. So you'd like to switch to an all-inertial navigation system. And inertial navigation requires accelerometers, acceleration measurement, and you need to know the local gravity field to back out errors from that, and you need gyroscopes. So we have proposals for quantum versions of all those things. And DARPA and the Navy have programs in precision inertial navigation that looks at quantum entanglement to boost the sensitivity of inertial navigation. They would like to submerge their submarine and circumnavigate their Earth and then come back up within a few centimeters of where they think they should be. Next slide, please. That's the goal. Yeah, and it's not necessarily us. Quantum LIDAR is something we worked on. This is for remote sensing, like Doppler, improving the resolution of Doppler radar for weather or military applications. Next slide, please. That's a LIDAR picture there. Those are actually buildings. It's kind of hard to tell they're buildings. This is actually a LSU proposal. This is the winning proposal from LSU. And you can see that we have a target, which is an incoming missile, an entangled light source, and a delay line. Next slide, please. And quantum sensors even hit the popular media. Our quantum gyroscope, which we had a whole web page on at NASA, somehow percolated into the movie Alias, where they try to steal the quantum gyroscope. Next slide, please. I don't have purple hair like that anymore. And then we'll end up in the quantum. I did one thing in a punk rock band, but I think my hair was red. Quantum imaging is where we'll end up at last. And I apologize for running a little over. Next slide, please. Quantum imaging, the idea is those improved resolution fringes in the interferograms that I showed can be used to actually do things like improved microscopes and improved lithography. So lithography is the process by which we make Intel's computer chips. The thing on the upper left is supposed to be a shrinking computer chip. This is a picture taken from the New York Times, a blurb that they wrote about an article we had in Physical Review Letters. Those little white fuzzy balls are supposed to be two entangled photons striking the chip and shrinking it. But the idea is using entangled particles, you could write more features on a computer chip without going to higher frequency light, which is the standard protocol. The thing on the bottom is a quantum coherence tomography microscope. The idea is to cancel out dispersion and boost the resolution using entangled photons from the source. And I'm going to end with something that's kind of spooky. It's called quantum seeing in the dark over on the right. So I think that's almost my last slide. Let me close. Again, this is back to this interferogram. I just want to understand where this is coming from. So when you, if you have a bunch of uncorrelated photons in a laser beam, there's something called the Rayleigh diffraction limit that says your ability to resolve things in a microscope is pretty much the wavelength of the light. So if you want to go to higher resolution, your only option, and this is also Intel's only option for building smaller transistors on the chip, is to go to shorter and shorter wavelengths. But that has its own problems. In biology, shorter wavelengths becomes UV to X-ray. It starts killing the samples that you're trying to image if you're trying to do in situ live imaging in a microscope. So our idea is to bundle say 10 red photons together, entangle them 10 at a time using quantum mechanical tricks, and then we have a quantum mechanical state, which is effectively a UV photon, but it propagates through the system as if it's red. And the idea is that the spacing between the blue peaks is a factor of 10 smaller than the spacing between the red peaks, so we beat the Rayleigh diffraction limit in resolution. This got a lot of attention. Next slide, please. And so one of the ideas is you would use this in an imaging system, a remote imaging system. One of the things that people are interested in is discrimination. I have two targets. Do I have two incoming jets or do I have one incoming jet? And the ability to decide this based on a classical light source is the Rayleigh diffraction limit. Next slide, please. 
meeting the Rayleigh diffraction limit would allow you with the same wavelength of photons. You know, ideally want to pick something around 1.5 microns in wavelength that has a transparency window in the atmosphere. You go to UV, it gets absorbed. So you can't build a LIDAR system with UV light very easily because it doesn't propagate very far. The idea is to use entangled red photons, get the resolution, but still have the transparency window, and you can resolve the two targets. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm almost done. So this is something uh, we've been working on most recently. It's called we call it quantum seeing in the dark or imaging with no photons at all. I'll end with the strangest thing. So the idea is that you have a, a target, which is this little soldier here. In the actual experiment, it's a toy soldier on, on an optical bench. And we set up a quantum interferometer, and we balance the interferometer so no photons go through the upper path where the toy soldier is sitting. And all the photons take the lower path uh, where the soldier is not sitting. Then we, we have some quantum tricks on the left in the source and some quantum tricks on the right in the imaging device. And we completely reconstruct the image. And there you can see the image of a toy soldier from uh, our, our, some of our collaborators at the Army Research Lab in Adelphi. But the interesting thing is that no light actually struck the toy soldier at all. And yet, we're able to reconstruct an image of the toy soldier, even though if it was a real soldier, he would be unaware that anybody was taking a picture of him because there's no flash. In total darkness, we can uh, carry out this experiment. It doesn't get any weirder than that. And I think that's my last slide. Next slide, please. Yep. So uh, we went through, we started off at foundations of quantum mechanics. You'll never get a job. Talked about quantum technology. Uh, and I, I'm trying to convince my students that, yes, you can get a job if you work at the foundations of quantum mechanics. And out of this, uh, these philosophical attempts to understand the true meaning of quantum mechanics emerged a whole portfolio of new technologies. Uh, and we have uh, 300,000 orders of magnitude of uh, this uh, quantum uh, space that we're going to explore in the next 50 years compared to 60 orders of magnitude of free space uh, in the past 2,000 years. And so it's a very exciting time, and, and we're having a lot of fun doing this. Thanks, thanks a lot, and thanks for putting up with me running over and my lame jokes. Thank you.